Hello, welcome to Zoonosis with Joy. I'm Joy, and on this channel I like to talk about animals' health and society. Today's video is going to be about dairy calf separation and the welfare and health problems that this can cause for dairy calves. Now, we're going to talk a little bit about animal abuse in this video, and specifically emotional and um, distress, that sort of thing. So if you're sensitive to this topic, maybe skip out on this one and come back to one of my other videos, The Bone Over Castle Dog. It's quite a good one. Um, so in this video, we're going to be talking about one specific practice within a broader industry of the dairy practice. There's so much you could talk about, of course, the ecological and welfare, as well as political and economic practices of the dairy industry that I find quite distasteful, personally. But this one, we're only going to be talking about one specific practice, just one thin slice of what is going on in the dairy industry. Now, to kind of give you a preliminary as to what we're looking at here, it is very common practice to separate the dairy calf from the dairy cow, probably within 12 hours of birth, often within three. The idea being is that the dairy calf gets their colostrum, which is the part that has very rich in fats and aminoglobulins from the cow, and then they are separated and put in a separate pen where they cannot see or hear the dairy cow. So this is a very common practice, and we'll get into the reasons why people support it, why it's a bad idea, and some final thoughts on that. But before we get into that, I want to take a quick detour into the field of psychology. Uh, so if we go back to the 1950s, a very interesting experiment by Harlow showed uh, exactly what happens if we separate infants from their mothers early on in life. Now, previous to that, there was a lot of debate between the Freudians and the behaviorists as to the importance of the mother. Right? So the behaviorists were of the opinion that really if you sustain all the physical things for an animal when they're young, they will have everything they need and they won't need the mom. The mom's just a complicating factor in the mammalian reproductive system. The Freudians, of course, were more concerned with, you know, the role of the mother as uh, with the whole Oedipus complex and that sort of thing. So the mother is important and if you're missing your mother, you've got lots of neuroses, that kind of thing. Harlow was one of the first workers to actually show the importance of the mom further beyond that, that kind of breaks the paradigm between the behaviors and the Freudians there. Really what they were looking at was they took baby monkeys and they separated from their mom 12 hours after birth and they raised them in a separate cage. Now, initially they had a wire frame with a bottle sticking through it right in the middle and uh, this would provide the sustenance. There would be, of course, heat and warmth for the monkeys to feel stable, but they would have everything they physically need, right? Food, water, shelter, you know, they're all sustained that way. However, what the researchers found is that these monkeys raised under these conditions often ended up quite disturbed, and they often have very poor growth trajectories, they were poorly socialized, they were more prone to getting sick and ill. Other things that they found is they actually did an experiment where they separated, uh, they had two different wire frames. One of the wire frame uh, was just kind of uncovered wire frame, they could put a bottle in it and that was it basically. The other wire frame they covered with skin, and if you've seen creepy pictures of this online, I'll put one up here just to kind of show you what we're looking at. Uh, but essentially what it was was a uh, surrogate mom, uh, a surrogate monkey mom with skin and eyes and a face. And they found that monkeys would preferentially cling to the one with skin, and they would hold on to that, even if that monkey mom didn't have a bottle attached to it. So monkeys would spend time on the one that provided care and warmth more than the one that would provide food. If they just put, the, uh, put a bottle of milk in a wire one and they put a monkey mom with skin on the other side, the monkeys would spend time on the mom to the detriment of actually getting physical uh, sustenance that way. It's really important to note this because animals will prefer to be with their mom more than they will prefer to get milk or milk replacers that this is a very important stage in their life, and if they lack it, they can lead to very devastating health consequences, which we'll talk about with dairy cows. So we've known about this for probably around 70 years now, and how has the dairy industry responded? No, they don't read these papers. Dairy people aren't interested in the psychological or mental well-being because, of course, it has no health benefits, right? Um, so if you're someone in the dairy industry, the biggest reasons why you'd want to separate the dairy calf from the dairy cow early on in life would of course be economic, right? You know, the calf will get its colostrum and then you can milk the cow until it stops lactating. That's usually two months before they give birth to the next calf and then you basically continue the cycle until the cow is too old or too sick and then you euthanize it, right? Um, the dairy calf is a hindrance to that. Oftentimes with the male bull dairy calves, they're sold directly to the veal industry, so that's another source of income for dairy farmers. 
or you raise the female dairy calves to become the next herd of dairy heifers that become uh, dairy cows in the future. Heifer is just an unbred, uh, or it's just a dairy cow that hasn't given birth yet, basically, there's terminology there. But um, when these ones are kept separate, they're fed on formula, which is a lot cheaper. And it's not milk. Milk you could sell to customers, you can't sell dick cow formula to humans. It just doesn't work that way. They're kept in little small pens, often with a chain on around their leg, or um, a little dog house and a water bottle feeder. Kind of like the Harlow experiment, now come to think of it. Um, with this, uh, the other major benefits that they've argued, and I will show unsuccessfully, is that this is more humane um, because, you know, if you break the bond early, um, the calf will not miss the mom, and therefore you're not causing them psychological harm if you, you know, if you do it later. The other benefit, of course, would be that you're kept, keeping generations separate, which provides an, a uh, microbiological barrier so that you're not getting infections with diseases. The big ones for dairy calves would be cryptosporidium, which is a form of a protozoal diarrhea. I'll post a picture of what the, not the diarrhea, but the uh, <laughs> actual protozoan looks like. Um, respiratory pathogens, there's bacterial, so um, of course, you know, Manheimia hemolyticum and uh, Mycoplasma bovis and that kind of thing, as well as the bovine respiratory syncytial virus and um, all those other ones. I'm not going to get into details on which respiratory pathogens. I probably could make a video in the future if anyone's really interested in it, but I'll just leave it at that. And the other one is Yoni's disease. Yoni's disease is caused by Mycobacterium paratuberculosis, or sorry, Mycobacterium avium paratuberculosis which is one that basically will infect um, cattle younger than six months, and then over the course of their lifespan, they'll have chronic diarrhea, wasting, and eventually die. Pretty severe, and it's been argued, especially for Yoni's disease, that keeping age groups separate is one of the biggest things that could, in theory, help prevent the spread of disease. We'll get into that in a second. So what happens if you separate a dairy calf from its mom? What are, what are the consequences for it um, health-wise or psychologically-wise? Well. They've actually done a study where they looked at the behavioral responses to calves that are kept away from their mom. And they find that, probably unsurprising to you, maybe surprising to people in the dairy industry, they often had a negative judgment bias, and which is indicative of chronic low mood. Um, you know, for humans, we'd call that depression. We call that anxiety. Uh, we're setting these calves up for chronic long-term distress, basically, by separating from their mom early on in life. Now, of course, this is bad humane-wise, but, you know, dairy farmers aren't necessarily interested in these things unless it, of course, has some sort of welfare and economic application. So what are the effects of chronic low stress and low mood? I mean, we know in humans that predisposes us to lots of different diseases like um, heart disease, diabetes, infectious disease. You know, you're stressed out during exams, you get sick. It's, it's, we kind of know this, right? With dairy calves, they also found that they're going to be more predisposed to developing diseases if they're stressed out. They're also less likely to grow fast. And they found that calves that are separated from early on in life versus calves that are separated four days later, um, the ones that were se uh, separated at four days often had a uh, better growth trajectory than the ones that were separated very early on in life, basically. So there's obviously a huge benefit to keeping them together, at least for the life history standpoint of that specific dairy calf. Now, there was also really, I should probably point this out as well, the argument that, oh, separating them uh, separates them from potential uh, shedders, pathogens, that one doesn't hold up to scrutiny. Uh, there was a recently a review study, and uh, I'll post the thing in the description as well, uh, that looked at what were the life history trajectories and um, or specifically what sort of studies prove a causal link between age separation and protection against disease, and there's actually very little or mixed evidence at best. Um, specifically for respiratory pathogens, there's actually no benefit that they found there. Cryptosporidium, the biggest thing that they found was um, actually in some cases having the calf next to the mom was actually protective because, you know, they are less stressed out, they don't get those kind of diseases uh, as easily, and they have more immune benefit that way. For Yoni's disease, they found a much stronger link between environmental hygiene and Yoni's disease, and there's actually no um, actual studies demonstrating a strong benefit to keeping age groups separate that way. So it doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. Um, if you look at this from more of a um, neurobiological perspective, um, I'm going to post a link to, uh, or post a thing in the description for Sapolsky's Behave, and it's a great book. Um, I've been reading it recently. Um, one of the things that he talks about is that in uh, rodents and in humans as well, 
early on in life, we actually have a period where our adrenal glands, um, uh, they, they undergo hypot um, hypotrophy or um, atrophy, basically. A temporary period where the adrenal glands actually shrink in size, so there's less steroid hormones being circulated. Why would a young infant need less stress hormone? I mean, they're in a new environment, there's lots of things going around. Well, it turns out that infants rely on their mom. And if you take, you know, if they're in the presence of their mom, they don't have to worry about anything. If there's any threats in their environment, they can shut down the system and reduce that. This gives them a huge immune boost. If you think about it, stress, cortisol, that inhibits the immunity, right? So if you're stressed out, you actually have lower immunity and you're more likely to get sick, right? So when you separate infants from their mom, they're going to have very poor immunity. They're much more likely to get sick. They don't grow as well. So... I mean, really, from the welfare perspective, of course, it's really bad that way. It's also making your calf sick. It's making them smaller. Um, what do the public think about this? Well, in large part, they are blissfully unaware, uh, probably by design. I mean, the dairy industry, of course, has a very strong lobby. I mean, think about the food pyramid. Where is dairy on that food pyramid? Right in the middle. It's, a, it's an important one. I mean, obviously, fats and Things are at the very top because you don't want to eat very much of those. But dairy is important, right? Because we can't survive without dairy. I mean, you can't go vegan or something like that, can you? Oh, who knows? Um, but uh, they don't want the public to know about this. In fact, when they did surveys, when they actually told the people about this practice, the majority of people have said, this is something that we should stop. This is We oppose this practice. The public doesn't like the idea that we're causing trauma and we're causing uh, cows to become sicker based on this practice that only will make the dairy farmers more money, that it's not benefiting the animals at all. Uh, so, I mean, there's definitely these uh, barriers to actually protecting their welfare. And I mean, I don't know if this is something that, um, I mean, obviously this is something that we could amend with legislation. We could say we are hereby banning dairy farmers from separating the cow from the calf for at least a week. At least a week. I mean, in the wild, how long are cows, uh, calves nursing from the cow? Like six months, right? Before true weaning, four to six months, something like that. Um, seven days isn't very long, right? And this is going to be the soft belt kind of legislation we would expect if that went forward. Um, another thing you could do, this is one of the few things, uh, things where I say, you know, consumer action makes a huge difference. Stop giving the dairy industry your money, right? Like... These guys are going to keep doing these sort of things. And I haven't even gone into anything like, you know, dehorning or tail docking or, you know, the unhygienic conditions or the ecological impacts or uh, this is something that we should stop giving the dairy industry our money. We should be organizing with people who want to oppose the dairy industry, working, looking towards alternatives to milk, looking at alternatives to cheese and butter. These are important things for our diet, right? Like... We don't need these foods to live, but they have cultural significance. So could we find a better way, please? You know, could we try to phase out dairy entirely if possible? I mean, I would be in favor of that personally, but that's just my opinion. Uh, I think that this is a huge welfare issue that the dairy farmers are purposely ignoring this, um, purposefully ignoring the science as far as I can see. I mean, I don't want to be labeled libelous because I don't know if that's 100% true. Maybe they're just ignorant. Maybe they just haven't been reading or hearing or doing anything for the last 70 years. And maybe the regulatory bodies that are looking at these things are ignorant to the science. Maybe they just don't know. Maybe there's something going on with the government turning a blind eye to these kind of, um, you know, well-known sort of uh, things that cause animals pain and distress, right? And who knows? I mean... I, I don't want to suggest that this is, uh, you know, willfully uh, belligerent. I mean, that, that's what it seems like from my perspective, and maybe I'm wrong. And I'm happy to be uh, told I'm wrong and happy to be, you know, pointed out that dairy farmers are working very hard. But I don't buy it. And frankly, it, neither should you. Um, you should be a little bit skeptical of what you're seeing from these people. Anyway, a lot of thoughts, a lot of personal opinions, but read the papers for yourself. Um, Read about Harlow. You can read Sapolsky too. I, it's a great book. Um, Behave. It's in the description. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts and comments. Um, some future ideas for future videos. And um, I will see you next time. Peace. Take care.